Hi everyone, I want to make a video talking about what I read in the month of June uh, because I read, no, wait, <laughs> what, what month was it just? It was just July, uh, so let's do that again. Hi everyone, I want to make a video talking about what I read in the month of July uh, because I read quite a lot and some, uh, some really great books, so I'm eager to discuss all of them. Uh, but before I get into them, I want to talk about an issue just to do with the booktube community in general. And that is to do with a video that was posted last week by Adam talking about the Booker Prize in which he mentioned me. And I have to admit, I was a bit upset uh, when I first saw this video and really caught off guard uh, because you have to understand, to hear yourself mentioned in a video in a public forum like this, and that's a satirical video, it's like, well, are, are we laughing with me or are we laughing at me? And it was a bit confusing and, and, uh, and I have to admit, I, I'm a sensitive person. I um, let this sort of play upon my own insecurities. It's, I realize, I fully realize it's nothing much to do with the video itself, more just my own insecurities. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, Adam fully is aware that quite often he walks a fine line between poking fun and mockery. And uh, so, you know, I, uh, it created some tension between us. And I just want to get all this out in the open and talk about it because I know there's uh, been some, some gossip and some chatter. And so I just want to clear the air and let you all know where we're at at the moment uh, because yeah, there has been this tension between me and Adam and we've been talking it out. And, uh, and I know that Adam's not going to discuss this on his channel because emotional sincerity isn't really something that Adam does, right? Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, I want to discuss it and be really open about it and not make any big drama about it. But the truth is that Adam and I have not only just kissed and made up, uh, but we've actually got engaged. Yes, I'm going to become Mr. Memento Mori. And how exciting is this? This is going to be the first booktube wedding. And we're hoping to have a spring ceremony. And this will give enough time uh, for Steve Donahue to become an ordained minister. And then hopefully he can marry us. And we want to have Joyce Carol Oates and Margaret Atwood at the ceremony as flower girls. And Ali Smith is going to be my best man. And uh, we are hoping to get married in the Boston Public Library because, you know, this is a, a perfect meeting point in between London and Seattle. So how great is that? And you are all invited. It'll be wonderful to have you all there in a big ceremony uh, that'll be live streamed and shot by Jean-Luc Godard. And you know, um, uh, uh, yeah, anyway, enough silliness. This, this is all really silly. I, I don't know why I'm going on like this. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I just, I just want to say I, there, there's no big drama. Um, we're all friends. It's all fine. And we're all just here to talk about books. We just want to have good discussions about books and, and that's, that's really the end of it. Although, um, I, I want to say, like, no bullshitting aside, I did um, fairly recently um, actually get engaged to my partner. Uh, so that, that is why I'm wearing a ring. Uh, because, uh, yeah, it's, it's lovely and wonderful. And, you know, it's sort of overdue because I've been with my partner for over 20 years now. Um, and of course, all of that time we've been together, we haven't legally been able to get married. But, uh, but yeah, it's something that we... Um, have been sort of discussing over time and yeah, so it's a it's gonna be a wonderful thing So th so that's really nice But uh, but yeah, anyway to get back to the books now because that's what I really want to discuss and uh, I'll start with talking about this novel called an honest man by Ben Ferguson This is his third novel. I've read his first novel, but I haven't read his second novel yet and I wanted to read this because I've enjoyed reading more fiction set in Berlin ever since I went there for the first time um, at the end of last year. And, uh, and this, this novel is really interesting. It's set in the year 1989, uh, before the fall of the Berlin Wall, and involves this 
whole sort of story between East and West, but told through the, the eyes of a, a boy, um, a teenage boy named Ralph, who's sort of coming of age. And it's his um, story over a, a summer when he has a girlfriend and a strong group of friends. They're all very artistic types and they live in the West side of Germany. And uh, he meets a man who he sort of falls for and has all these feelings for. And it, um, yeah, it, it sort of goes from there, but also involves a story of espionage and spying. And, uh, but in a way that you don't really expect, um, there's a fair number of twists in this book. And, and, uh, and so it made me second guess what, what was really happening. And, uh, and I really enjoyed how he did that. And, uh, but also just creating this whole atmosphere of before the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and how strained and odd that whole atmosphere of Berlin must have been in that time and you know the tensions between East and West leading up to uh, the Berlin Wall's collapse. So it's a really well-plotted novel to do with family and sexuality and uh, and I quite like that the, the protagonist, Ralph, he, you know, he's not an entirely likable character. Uh, like a lot of teenagers, um, he's quite selfish and doesn't consider other people's feelings. So I quite enjoyed how it didn't just make him angelic, but uh, but yeah, this is a novel I'd really recommend. And I finished reading Joyce Carol Oates' new novel, My Life as a Rat. And this novel sort of harkens back to one of her most famous novels, uh, We Were the Mulvaney's, because it's similarly about the story of a teenage girl who's outcast from her family. Uh, but in My Life as a Rat, it's the story of Rue Kerrigan, and she witnesses her brothers on an evening after they've uh, performed a racist attack and trying to cover that up. And uh, she tells the authorities about this and um, her brothers are sent to prison and so she is completely outcast from the family. And what's so moving about this novel is how she writes about her process in the, the years, many years following this attack. and how um, the, the complexities of family, because it's, you know, I think one of the most terrifying questions we can ask ourselves is like, how much does it take before our families don't love us anymore and, you know, will reject us? Because I think that, you know, that's, that's something that's really scary, um, the thought of that. And so she, she tests the bonds of, of how strong is this familial love? And, uh, and, and what, what are the limits of it? And, um, and what's, what's really moving and heartbreaking about this story is that Rue, even though um, her family has rejected her, she still feels really loyal to them and she tries to win back their love. She, she wants to, to, um, to be part of the family. And, and, uh, and yeah, so it's quite a heartbreaking story, but also really moving her, her process of finding independence and also trying to understand how to navigate to create a relationship with them, but one that, um, that where she isn't getting all of her self-esteem from being a member of this family. And uh, yeah, I found it very moving, but also the way she explores the, the issue of loneliness in this novel, because she um, talks about loneliness as something, you know, which you can easily fall back on because there's sort of no stakes. If it's just you, you know, you don't have to sort of deal with other people's egos. And, and, um, and yeah, so, and I found that, that aspect of the, the novel quite moving as well. So, um, so yeah, I thought, I thought this was a really great novel, um, but also, you know, addressing obviously a lot of social and political issues. And it just made it a really hard hitting and memorable story. I read Rowan Hisio Buchanan's new novel, Starling Days, and I loved her first novel. And um, this novel is very moving. It's interesting seeing her development as a writer because um, she has a very a strong, like distinct way of writing, um, structuring her books in that this novel is also the stories of two characters. Um, in this case, it's Oscar and Mina. And she, she really creates a balance in her narrative between two different stories and showing two different perspectives on life as you know, a way of showing that all experience is really subjective and there's no one objective right way of looking at people's relationships or history. And, uh, and so Oscar and Mina, they're a fairly young couple living in New York City. 
and Mina suffers from mental health problems. And Oscar is the illegitimate child um, of his father, who's a business owner, and he works with his father. Um, but it makes this sort of odd, tense um, relationship between them. And, uh, and so Mina and Oscar, they decide to move to London because Oscar's father has some property there, which he's agreed to help him sell up and get a profit from. And while they're there, um, they meet a, a, a woman who Mina develops an attraction for because she's bisexual and she's always uh, been bisexual and, and Oscar knows this. Um, but she finds she starts developing these strong feelings for this other woman. And so the story plays out from there. And, uh, and what's, I think, especially moving about this novel is how it portrays the, the whole issue of mental health and how really there's no perfect way to treat issues to do with mental health and there's no permanent fix to it. It shows how it's like a constant process and there's lots of complications with it because as you're adjusting medication and treatment and therapy and uh, working through issues of self-esteem, you know, you're also trying to navigate social relationships and and uh, yeah, and I found that all really moving and powerful. But one small criticism I would have about the novel and her style of writing, I don't know how much this is a conscious choice, but in some points she'll, she'll write a sort of unnecessarily complicated sen uh, sentence, um, which is, uh, you know, just something like, uh, with his hands, he picked up his phone, rather than just saying he picked up his phone. And, and uh, yeah, I don't know if that's trying to show a certain level of self-consciousness or, um, or if that's uh, yeah, just a sort of unnecessarily complicated way that she's writing. But, um, but I mean, overall, I did find this novel really moving and, and powerful and, and, uh, and I felt really connected and like I knew the characters she was writing about. Lou Etz by Maggie Nelson, and I've wanted to read more by Maggie Nelson ever since I read The, the Argonauts, which was, you know, a big selling book and, and lots of people were talking about it. And, uh, and this is a, a nonfiction book she wrote all about the, the color blue, and she, she just wanted to write about uh, sort of the, the history of the way color is interpreted, because there's a lot of literature all around this. Um, but um, but she also you know interjects a lot of her personal life and thoughts and feelings into this as well about the breakdown of a relationship that that she was having, and also her friendship with a, a woman who uh, had an accident and became a quadriplegic and all the many complications involved with that, and uh, and so she weaves in the personal alongside all of this this research and these really powerful meditative thoughts uh, about life and you know meaning and and so it's I found her writing really you know philosophical and, and very moving and not all of her ideas sort of connect up but it's all really thought-provoking and this was rein really reinforced because I got to see Maggie Nelson um, give a talk at the South Bank Center um, a couple of weeks ago and that was really powerful and moving uh, hearing her talk um, it just made me want to be back in university and listen to university like really inspiring university lecturers again because you know I just love that whole sort of forum where we can just talk about ideas and uh, and but in a really meaningful way and, and how they connect with our lives and something I found really powerful that she talked about that I'll show a little bit a little clip of is uh, is when she was talking about the, the issue of honesty yeah this idea of honesty being more true if it's more brutal and um, I don't think that that's true um, but there's a I, that's where I was writing a lot about Ivy Compton Burnett um, and her characters, people will often say things, you know, like they'll just say the most horrid things to each other, just terrible things, and then they'll just say, well, it's true, you know, you always have been uglier than your sister, and you know, well, it's true, you know, how I'm just saying it like it is, and that, you know, there's honesty, and then, you know, brutality is something else that you lay on top of it, you know, but I think that, of course, when you write, th there's something brutal about the fact that you know, your experience, whether it's in love or, I mean, this is what a lot of Bluettes was about, about the relativity of color, that when we both say, I'm wearing blue, you know, and you might say, oh, it's purple, and it's kind of like a chasm's opened up between you because you're using a language, but you're not sharing an experience, and that the same thing can happen when we say we believe in God or when we say I love you, and that there's a kind of betrayal in the fact that we have individual experience that we presume to be shared 
And I think every time you write and render other people, you are exposing that chasm. So I just found that really moving and powerful how she talked about that. And there's so many sections in this book that really raise issues like, like that, um, that make you stop and, and think for a while. And, uh, and I found myself continuously doing that throughout this book. And of course, as I talked about in my Booker Prize video, uh, there are a lot of books on the list that I'm quite eager to read. And so I decided to plunge right in with one of the shorter books, um, which is Kevin Barry's novel, Night Boat to Tangier. And this novel does sort of play homage to uh, another great Irish writer, Samuel Beckett, and his play, Waiting for Godot, because it is about two men, uh, Maurice and Charlie, who are older men, and most of the novel is them just sitting on a bench and talking, just talking, and they're, they're waiting for one of their daughters to arrive at uh, this port in Spain, and uh, boats are coming in and out with, the, there's no sort of, uh, set schedule or regularity to them. Um, they just sort of have to to wait and uh, and so it is sort of playing upon that play But there is a definite realistic story to their tale and um, and it's quite a, a complicated plot when you get down to it because there's a lot of history between them a lot of complicated history and there's things they're talking about and there's things they're not talking about and as the novel goes on you and you understand more about their past you understand more the things that they don't talk about and so I thought it was really clever how it did that uh, but also it's the whole thing is just infused with this real Irish sense of humor I mean I found a lot of it really funny as well as parts of it you know really scary and terrifying because um you know they're they're two uh aging gangsters and they've done a lot of violent things and they might do more violent things and uh so you know there's quite a lot of tension there as well and there's a lot of play with language and uh he's just an excellent writer and uh you know this novel didn't let me down i don't know already uh if it'll be my favorite book on the list but i did massively enjoy reading it boy swallows universe by trent dalton uh, this australian novel which is a debut and really impressive debut. Um, it's quite a long, complicated novel all about a uh, boy named, a teenage boy named Eli, uh, who's, it's a sort of coming of age tale in the year 1983 in Brisbane, and his parents are drug dealers, and he, he has a mother and a, sort of a, a, a new man that, that she's with, and they're drug dealers. <laughs> And uh, he has, as his sort of mentor, a um, ex-con man who was quite a, a famous ex-con man, and uh, and but who nevertheless exerts this positive influence on his life. And he has an older brother who's a mute, um, who doesn't talk for various reasons, which are related over the course of the novel. And uh, yeah, and so it's the story of of his life. Um, and. But it takes such an odd, interesting perspective and, um, and his development and how he eventually wants to become a journalist. And I found it really moving how it got to that point and, and how it really encapsulated how, like when, uh, when sort of pitching a, a news story, he has to summon up what he, he wants to, to say, the importance of the story, in just three words. And it, and it becomes this... Um, much more big meaningful thing where it's like how do you sum up your life if you only have like three words in in which to pitch it how how do you summarize all the the meaning in your life in just a few amount of words and uh, and I, I i thought it was really interesting how this novel played with language in in that way of, of how we articulate our experience and and how we express ourselves and you know in in a way of um, establishing our own importance in the world and, and that our existence has meaning. And so, you know, it has these big, um, bigger like themes to it, but, but really it's like this rich, thrilling story about the, the drug trade and, uh, and it has a really, you know, gripping plot to it. And, and, uh, and there's uh, a lot of violence in it, but, but also a lot of humor and, uh, and uh, sort of good naturedness to it, despite you know a lot of these characters having slightly questionable motives and questionable actions that that they perform, so I found it a really powerful novel. And I read Colson Whitehead's new novel, The Nickel Boys, uh, which has just been published. A lot of people have been talking about it, and for good reason. It's an excellent, excellent 
novel, uh, so powerful. It's mainly the story of Elwood and his uh, sort of coming of age in Florida in um, the, the time in the sixties in the time of um, civil rights movement. But through um, circumstances, he ends up in a uh, young people's correctional facility in Florida, which is supposed to be about a school and more about education. On the outside, that's the way it's presented, but really it's a very harsh prison um, in which the prisoners are segregated. So there's a white section and a black section. And, uh, and yeah, it's about uh, the prison life there. And, um, and it is about several other people in the facility as well and goes into their stories and focuses on their stories as well, but mainly the story of Elwood and, and, uh, and yeah, and, and it's about the, um, this overall structure. And, you know, not just the way that this prison system was racist and, and you know, really favored the, the white prisoners over the black prisoners, uh, but also the way that really the whole community was involved in this in a way because um, the, the boys were sort of farmed out as labor within the community and the, um, they, they produced goods um, to, which were sold to the community at a profit, which were held by the people who ran the prison and, and the supplies to the, the prison were, were being siphoned off and sold off for, for profit and uh, you know, obviously not for the boys' benefit and that there were regular um, harassments and beatings and killings within the prison. And yeah, it, it, it really gets into all this detail in a really moving way and, and, and so shows a really different side to it because I think we sort of feel like, well, there's been lots of stories about the civil rights movement and this takes a really different tact and, and it also is based on the true story of a, of a uh, young people's correctional facility in Florida. Uh, where uh, a lot of these things happened. And, and uh, so, yeah, it's an incredible, powerful story. Uh, and yeah, I, I think he's a genius. I mean, I loved the Underground Railroad and this is quite different from that. Um, it's a much more straightforward, really realistic novel, but one that, um, you know, does have a gripping plot as well. There's sort of twists in it and it went in a way I wasn't expecting. And, uh, and yeah, I was really gripped and moved by the whole experience. And I also read uh, two novels, which are sort of surprisingly, uh, I th were kind of connected with each other um, in that they, they both uh, portray these intentional communities. And uh, so there's The Blydell Romance by Nathaniel Hawthorne and Iris Murdoch's novel, The Bell. And, uh, and I want to read, um, Hawthorne because, well, I wanted to do a buddy read with Matthew Sharapa and we read this together and, uh, and he wanted to read some Hawthorne. And I'd always wanted to read the Blythdale Romance um, for a couple of reasons. One, because Joyce Carol Oates, back to Joyce Carol Oates, she wrote a novel called A Bloodsmore Romance. Um, so the title obviously is a play upon this Hawthorne novel. But also I wanted to read it because I knew it was about an intentional community. And I've just always had a real interest in intentional communities. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, I wanted to see Nathaniel Hawthorne's take on it. And I was, I, I, I was quite interested. I'd read a lot of Thoreau when I was a teenager. And so was quite interested in all the sort of transcendentalists, which um, Nathaniel Hawthorne was sort of tensionally a part of. And uh, yeah, it's a really odd novel though. I mean, it, one of the big issues I had with it um, in the end was that it was more about the romance side than the Blythdale side of it. And I recognize that's partly just my own expectations and what I wanted from the novel, because I wanted it to be more detailed about the community and the workings of the community and the sort of complications of being in making an intentional community and trying to start from scratch, you know, with your own new society. And, uh, and it didn't really get much into the details of that, though I found it like very funny in parts because the main character of it, he's a poet, um, he's very idealistic and he goes to this community um, uh, with you know, these high ideals, but, uh, but you know, this happens a lot with intentional communities. There's sort of intellectuals that go into these communities but don't have really much practical experience. And almost immediately when he gets to his community, he gets a cold. And so rather than going out and plowing the fields and you know, tending to the cows, he just he sits in his bedroom moaning and, 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 uh, and not doing very much. But, uh, but yeah, it got much more into the relationship of this mysterious woman who joins the community, who's very beautiful and forceful and a feminist. 
and a younger woman who um, joins the community and who also has a mysterious past and a, another man at the community who uh, the main character develops a sort of rivalry with and, um, and then it just gets much more into their complicated relationship and uh, then I wanted to see more, yeah, just about the, the community. And, um, and also the, the tone of it is really odd. Like some parts get really gothic and twisted and weird and surreal. There's a whole surreal bit where he's being chased by these um, sort of very uh, threatening characters. Um, so like one of them is, is this really stereotypically portrayed image of an Indian um, uh, who wants to take his scalp and it's, it's just so weird like just the tone of it is very odd um, but also just the um, the way it talks about men and women in this it it goes to a lot of lengths to talk about like well men are this way and women are this way and you know and I don't expect any sort of like uh, feminist thing from this although you know the the older woman in the community she's supposed to be a feminist and and uh, and so yeah I just find it very odd and antiquated all this this talk of of how the way men are and the way women are it, it just um yeah it doesn't seem very useful anymore uh but also it felt like there were a lot of just in jokes in this that he was he was having this dialogue with some of the philosophies at the time but in a very specific way a way that i felt like if i went and read a lot more maybe i would get some more of the references but i just because I don't know enough about it, I, I didn't get them. And yeah, so I was, felt a bit alienated from it. I did find his character touching and moving at some points. Like at, at one point later in the novel, he feels very alienated from his experience. And he describes himself almost as like a ghost traveling around the community, looking in the windows uh, as, as if he's completely separated from it now. And also just, yeah, the, as for the humor again, like he gets really so frustrated that he's not part of anything anymore, that he even when he walks past a pasture and he sees some cows, he gets frustrated that the cows are ignoring him. So he starts throwing things at the cows. And, and it was just so ridiculous that I feel like Hawthorne must have been sort of making fun of his character. But I just, because of the language and tone of it, I found it difficult to understand where he was sort of poking fun and where he was he was being trying to be serious. Um, so yeah, it, it was an odd experience reading this. Um, and then I read Iris Murdoch's novel, The Bell, um, which I'd wanted to do because it's uh, Iris Murdoch's centenary of her birthday in July. And so I wanted to read one of her novels. And uh, and this one, I, I don't, almost sort of forgot that it was, it's about an intentional community. So it's about a religious lay community in uh, in Britain and that's attached to an abbey and a nunnery. And uh, and it, it, uh, it mainly involves a character um, named Dora who travels to this community. She's a complete outsider. She's trying to, she has a very difficult relationship with her husband and she's trying to reconcile her relationship with him. But then it's also about a man named Michael who heads the community and who has religious inclinations, um, but has had struggles realizing that because he's, um, He's a homosexual, and he uh, he's had issues in the past where he um, he sort of flirted with a, a younger man, and who then betrayed him, and uh, and then at this new community, there's a young man named Toby, who um, he finds he has a sort of attraction for, and uh, yeah, that raises more complications. So so this novel also is you know about a romance and and complicated relationships, but it also gave me what I wanted more about the complications of an intentional community because it does get in at some points to the gritty detail of all the the difficulties of uh, trying to have a society like this, start your own little society because when you have a lot of people, especially people who are really zealous about their ideas, you get a lot of clashes. And so even small details about like whether to buy a plow or not or whether to um, to shoot the, uh, the, the pests on on uh, that live on their farm, like the rabbits and things, um, whether to shoot them or not, um, is becomes this big, huge question that they have to have multiple, multiple meetings about. And you know, and, and it's just all that tedious detail, which she alludes to and, and makes you understand all the complications involved without getting into it. And um, you know, and sometimes the um, all the sort of romance side of it, it does get a bit melodramatic and over the top, but uh, but. You know, uh, there's, this novel also has an introduction, this edition of it has an introduction by Sarah Perry. And Sarah Perry talks about how this is really a gothic novel and which I hadn't really 
thought about it in that context, but when I think about it and as she was talking about the tropes of it, that really made sense. And of, I mean, of course she would point this out because she, she's someone who, who uh, is, uh, sort of self-identifies as a Gothic novelist and she talks about the complications of that as well in the introduction. But it's interesting now she points out too that this, was, this novel was written only the year after same-sex relations were legalized in Britain. And so, you know, it's still a very hot topic at the time this was written to talk about a um, homosexual man sympathetically and how it's, it's, it's a very pro-sex novel. It, like, he talks about his feelings as he doesn't see them as unnatural, but it does obviously raise complications in trying to reconcile his faith with these um, sexual feelings that he has. And, and so, yeah, it really gets into all the, the complications of that in a way that feels very modern and, you know, that still not many writers are doing. And so, um, yeah, massively enjoyed this novel. So, uh, so yeah, there are a lot of books um, that I, I read this month, a lot of great ones. Um, let me know if you read any of these, if you have any thoughts of them, or if you're interested in reading them now. And uh, we can have a bit of a chat. And uh, yeah, so, um, so yeah, I'm glad we can just, uh, you know, don't want to get into sort of drama and interpersonal relationships on booktube you know i really just want to discuss books and and have some good conversations about books because really that's what all this is about so i'll talk to you again soon uh, and take care bye